appreciate you being here. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our press briefing with regard to the state's response to the pandemic. As always, we remind people, even with uh, more people getting vaccines, we still do have the virus in the community. Uh, we've actually been at a 5% positivity rate now for about the last five, or five or six weeks, which is great news, but that still does mean that people are still getting coronavirus. So please continue to practice all of our good uh, tools to be able to slow the spread of the virus. Keep that six foot of distance between you and other people when you're out in public. Wash your hands often with soap and water for 20 seconds at a time. Wear a mask when you go to the store. And please, if you have lost your sense of taste or smell or got that fever or that cough, stay home until you can be tested. We don't want you taking the risk that you've got coronavirus and that you're then passing it on to somebody else. So please take advantage of testnebraska.com. Uh, we've tested over 716,000 people. We're getting those test results back. In the last seven days, it's averaged less than 14 hours. Uh, so please uh, take advantage of Test Nebraska, but do not go out if you have those symptoms. We need people to stay home and you know, continue to uh, avoid the three Cs. All that sort of stuff will help us slow the spread of the virus. And of course, the reason we're doing that is to preserve our hospital capacity. Uh, right now, we're looking at a hospital capacity of 32% of our hospital beds are available and 37% of our ICU beds are available. So we've got very robust ho hospital capacity. Uh, we're, yesterday, we were at 129 uh, people in the hospital with coronavirus. So that's uh, about 3%, a little over of our overall hospital beds, which is very good. But again, that does is a reminder that getting the virus can get you into the hospital. So please continue to take those precautions. Uh, we've also uh, delivered now 690,000, over 690,000 vaccines here in the state of Nebraska. And we've got some good news with regard to uh, how that stacks up with the rest of the country. Uh, the CDC actually just uh, published a report that showed Nebraska is the fifth best state in the country for vaccinating vulnerable populations. So that's really good news. That shows we're targeting those vaccines in the right direction, the right way. Uh, we are the 10th uh, state as far as percent of population who are fully vaccinated, uh, that 14%, and 12th with regard to the percent dose uses, 82%. Those are from the New York Times. And uh, we're also, the CDC publishes a report that shows that we're eighth in the country for 18-year-olds or older doses being administered per 100,000. So per 100,000 of 18-year-olds or older, we're number eight in the country. So. All good news there. And we have vaccinated 71.75% of our population that is 65 years and older. Again, this has been one of our focuses from the beginning where we focused on 65 years and older. I think that's also what's led us to be number five as far as overall getting vulnerable populations by uh, targeting 65 years and older. So uh, that is all good news there. All right. So. Um, before, oh, and then just one other thing with regard to um, uh, vaccines. There are reports that Douglas County is uh, vac uh, using vaccines for telecom companies. That is outside the guidelines. They're not supposed to be doing that. They made a mistake. Uh, we told them weeks ago that telecoms are not part of utilities, and for whatever reason, they decided to go forward with uh, telecom companies that is outside the guidelines, they're making a mistake, and that's actually taking away vaccines from those vulnerable people we're trying to focus on. So uh, we're gonna be following up with Douglas County to get them to correct that, because they really need to be focused on those vaccines on people who are going to be vulnerable. That's a, a huge mistake on Douglas County's part. All right, so uh, today we've got a couple different speakers. We're gonna start with Angie Ling, who is the incident commander for the Department of Health and Human Services. She's gonna come up and talk about some of the, the new guidelines we're gonna have with regard to vaccines uh, with, um, and our policies. As we've talked about, we've really focused on those folks who have been 65 years and older in phase 1B. What we're gonna be announcing is starting on Monday, uh, and actually some of our health departments are already there. Statewide though, we're going to be going to uh, really phase two where we're going to be focusing on people who are 50 to 64 years old. Now again, we're going to the next age bracket down because they are the next most vulnerable folks in that category where we know that the single biggest correlation 
between getting the virus and your chance of dying from it, that mortality, is age. So we're going to continue to focus on age. The next bracket down will be 50 to 64-year-olds. And again, as I've talked about in the past, for example, when we looked at Nebraska data, uh, just the cohort 50 to 59 had twice as many deaths, more than twice as many deaths, as everybody 49 years and younger, all those cohorts combined. So that's why we're focusing on 50 to 64-year-olds. So what we're doing is asking local health departments to focus 90% of the vaccines on that group 50 to 64, and again, still prioritizing older people, and then they can use that 10% to focus on folks who have underlying health conditions. Now, the state is not going to be making determinations about those underlying health conditions. We're asking our local health directors to work with their providers, their doctors, to be able to make those determinations. So, for example, that's what Pat Lopez here in Lancaster County has been doing, has been working with her folks here locally to go to, say, cancer centers or dialysis centers uh, to be able to get to folks who are uh, going to have those underlying conditions. So, uh, I'm going to call up Angie Ling, who's going to come up and tell us a little bit more about this. So, Angie, you want to come on up and talk to us about our new directed health measure and the 50 to 64 category? Thank you, sir. Good morning. Happy Friday. It's hard to believe we're over three months into vaccination ever efforts and have delivered over 690,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, uh, we have over 71% of our 65 and older population vaccinated as well. As the governor mentioned, the CDC has uh, Nebraska ranked as eighth in the United States for doses delivered per 100,000 of our population, and the New York Times has us ranked at 12th in the United States for percent of doses used. The CDC's MMWR report also noted Nebraska as fifth in the United States for vaccinating its most vulnerable populations. I tell you these statistics not to pat ourselves on the back, but to inform Nebraskans that the focus that we decided on and the goals that we decided on are holding true. <clears throat> Our weekly first dose allocation is holding steady at 25,740 doses of Pfizer each week and 18,400 doses of Moderna. For the past two weeks, we've received 2,200 doses of Johnson & Johnson each week and are told that Johnson & Johnson weekly allocation will increase the week of March 29th. This week, nine health jurisdictions started vaccina vaccinating age 50 to 64, and starting on Monday, March 22nd, the entire state will move to phase 2A, which is age 50 to 64. Many of the health departments are working on the final groups of phase 1B, and the state has coordinated and scheduled Johnson & Johnson to go to the phase 1C groups the week of March 29th. The population in Nebraska in the age 50 to 64-year-old group is approximately 350,000 people, and we have about 90,000 residents in that age group already vaccinated, which is about 26%, <clears throat> and that's from the phase 1A and 1B groups. We will continue to lower the age to ensure all the schedules are full, so anyone who wants to get vaccinated needs to go to vaccinate.ne.gov to get registered. There's no need to wait at this point. Your turn may be here before you know it, and I don't want anyone to miss the earliest possible um, opportunity to get vaccinated. If you do not have the ability to go online, remember our call center, which is 833-998-2275, and we can assist you in registration. Also, we did receive financial assistance from FEMA and have been working diligently to apply uh, to our vaccination efforts. We've worked with various groups who are vaccinating the community and will assist in reimbursement of staff costs. We're providing some IT support in the form of tablets to help transition them to a paperless system. And we are providing syringes, sharps containers, medical waste removal, and more. We'll also be providing additional supplies such as tents, generators, or any on-site equipment to make the vaccination sites more robust. In closing, I want to emphasize the need to get registered now at vaccinate.ne.gov. Do not wait. With an all-time high of vaccines administered yesterday, the mission to vaccinate Nebraska will only continue to grow as our allocations increase, and we look forward to serving Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angie. Did you have that chart up? Uh, yeah, that one right there. So this is from that um, uh, MWWR, oh no, so WMMR, right? Mort yeah. Weekly Mortality and Morbidity Road. So WMMR report. So uh, here's Nebraska right here. 
And you can see this is the chart they were looking at with uh, the 65 years and older, so, or uh, with the most vulnerable. So uh, again, that's the report that Angie was referring to, and this is what was just published uh, by that uh, WMMR report. So thank you very much, and again, uh, to your point, Angie, we are moving now into that 50 to 64-year-old category. So if you are in that age range or younger, it's a great opportunity to go to vaccinate.ne.gov and sign up. Or again, if you don't have access to a computer, you can call 1-833, this is a toll-free number, 833-998-2275. So when you sign up, that's how we'll know to be able to contact you to let you know about your turn to be able to get scheduled and get a vaccine. So moving on, oh, uh, wanna, uh, so we got another thing before we get into our next part of the program. Uh, the uh, IRS has notified us that they are moving the tax deadline from April 15th to May 17th. So they're pushing it back about a month. And so we've received questions about will Nebraska be following suit? Again, Nebraska, we uh, marry our tax code with the federal government's tax code. So we will be moving that deadline back as well. There will be no you know, penalties or fees or whatever uh, for filing on May 17th. So yes, Nebraska will be essentially moving our deadline back as well to May 17th. So you'll have an extra month to file your taxes. Okay. Next, we're going to Doctor's Day. So we know throughout the course of this last year that our healthcare professionals have worked very, very hard to keep Nebraskans healthy and to get them back on their feet. And our doctors have just done yeoman work with regard to caring for patients, but also doing research in the field as well. So collecting data, helping us understand better how this pandemic is impacting all of us, and of course, weighing in directly with uh, their patients. Uh, again, doctors are the ones that are working with our health directors right now with regard to folks who have those underlying health care conditions and determining you know, who is going to be the highest priority, who's the most at risk. So our doctors play a vital role in keeping us healthy, and we very much appreciate all their hard work that they do on a regular basis, but especially over the course of this last year when doctors had to work so hard and had, um, again, never seen a pandemic like this before either, and so we're learning along with the rest of us on how to manage it. So we're very grateful today that we've got the president of the Nebraska Medical Association, Dr. Michelle Walsh, who is going to come here and say a few words about all the great work doctors are doing. Uh, we also have with us the executive director of the Nebraska Medical uh, Association, Amy Reynoldson, who's here. Uh, she's not going to be speaking, but she's here as well, as uh, well as our the communications director for the Nebraska Medical Association. Uh, uh, Betsy Jones is here as well, so thank you both for joining us. And with that, uh, Dr. Walsh, we can come up and uh, say a few words about the great work our doctors are doing. Oh, I'm sorry, before you do that, sorry, I almost forgot my part. The other thing we're doing is proclaiming March 30th, Doctor's Day here in Nebraska. And so, Dr. Walsh, I'm going to be signing a proclamation that you can take back with you and uh, show everybody that we are proclaiming March 30th as Doctor's Day and asking Nebraskans to recognize all the great work that our doctors are doing. All right, so now you can come up, and I will present this to you. Actually, like that. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Thank Walsh. Thank you. Well, thank you, Governor Ricketts. The governor's proclamation for the observance of Doctors' Day on Tuesday, March 30th, 2021, is especially meaningful for our healthcare community, as we just recently hit the one-year mark in our fight against this unprecedented pandemic. The members of the Nebraska Medical Association appreciate the tireless work and dedication of our physician colleagues and Nebraska's medical community as a whole throughout the last year. Even though our state's medical leaders and our city, state, and federally elected officials had varying opinions on how to navigate the pandemic, our passion for protecting the physical, social, and economic health of Nebraskans brought us together. Thank you, Governor Ricketts, for inviting the Nebraska Medical Association to the table when discussing the way medicine is practiced in Nebraska now and into the future. We look forward to continuing our successful collaboration with state officials in the years to come. To my fellow Nebraskans, you don't have to wait until March 30th to show your appreciation to your medical teams. Every day can be doctor's day. Take a moment to write a card, 
or the next time you're in a medical facility, tell people how much you appreciate the dedication and sacrifice of the physicians, nurses, and their dedicated staff illustrated through their work and care. What the last year has shown us is that everyone needs encouragement, but especially those who have fought a difficult fight through long hours, emotional stressors, and an overly demanding workload while in a fast-changing environment. Finish strong, Nebraska, is the current slogan surrounding the efforts of Nebraska DHHS to stay steadfast in our fight against COVID-19. The slogan is fitting, Nebraska, a state where people have continued to exemplify a strong work ethic throughout a pandemic and display sincere desire to help keep each other safe. Finish strong, Nebraska, continue to practice the three C's, avoid confined spaces, avoid crowded places, and avoid close contact settings while continuing to practice good hand washing and mask wearing as recommended. Additionally, please contact your physician if you have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine or go to vaccinate.ne.gov. Thank you, Governor Ricketts, for declaring March 30th, 2021, Doctor's Day in Nebraska. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. Appreciate it and appreciate your colleagues coming from the Nebraska Medical Association. All right, so now we're going to uh, go on. Oh, I uh, want to hit, uh, before we get into Q&A, uh, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow is meat on the menu day. So uh, please en uh, encourage everybody to go out and have meat as part of a healthy diet. Uh, maybe grab a hamburger for lunch and maybe a steak or some ribs for dinner, maybe uh, a nice roast chicken, something like that. Uh, we want to make sure we're supporting our farmers and ranchers here in Nebraska. Meat is a part of a healthy diet. That lean meat is great for you. Uh, you can get as much protein from three ounces of beef as three cups of quinoa. And while I don't know anybody who wants to sit down and eat three cups of quinoa at once, I can polish off three ounces of beef like that and go back for more. So uh, you can get uh, great healthy nutrition there. It's great for our food security. Uh, much of the world's landmass is uh, not suitable for, air, uh, you know, arable for crops for human consumption, but can be grazed by animals, which then in turn can be consumed by humans. Our sandhills are kind of an example of that here in Nebraska. And so it's uh, important for our food security. And then finally, uh, obviously, Nebraska is an agricultural state. Uh, we get about $21 billion a year in receipts from our agricultural industry. About $12 billion of that comes from livestock, and about $6 billion is just beef. So we can help support our farmers and ranchers by putting meat on the menu tomorrow, Saturday, March 20th. So please remember that. Okay, so next we're going to go to the upcoming schedule, which will be Monday at 10 a.m., we will be back here in this room, but we'll be uh, talking about Ag Week. And then Ag Week, I'll be doing tours on Tuesday and Wednesday next week, highlighting the great work of our farmers and ranchers and all the other associated industries that we have here next week for National Ag Week. And with that, we'll go ahead and get into questions and answers. And we've got several that were submitted ahead of time here. So uh, Brent Bonfleur from KLKN asks, we're hearing a lot about vaccine tourism. Has the state given any directives to local health departments as far as vaccinating people from outside their country or their county, district, or even people from outside the state? So with regard to that, the way it works is that you have to sign up in advance to get a vaccine. You can't just show up at a vaccine clinic and get a vaccine. When you sign up, we ask for where your, your residence is. So we keep it to people from Nebraska. And uh, with regard to those local health districts, uh, you know, again, that when we get a statewide system, it'll be easier to manage this. But uh, in general, we're keeping it to folks from Nebraska. Same thing with the federal pharmacy program. You have to be from Nebraska to get that. Now, having said that, we are doing uh, vaccinations, for example, in of uh, meat processing plants in places like uh, Dakota County, where we've got a lot of Iowans coming across the border that work there. So we will capture Iowans in that. But again, this is under the you know, controlled situation where we know who we're vaccinating, that there are going to be Iowans a part of that workforce. It's not something where people can just, you know, drive to Nebraska from another state and get in line and get a, a vaccine. You can't do that here in Nebraska. So we don't really have vaccine tourism here in the state. Uh, Iowa is among the latest states to announce it will soon be giving vaccinations to all residents. 
Is Nebraska falling behind in that regard, and has the state been able to determine whether focusing on people 65 years and older will ultimately speed up or slow down the overall process? So again, what we're doing here in Nebraska is we've got a plan that, just as we've done all along, is our plan right for Nebraska. We have focused on 65 years and older because our data here in Nebraska shows that 83% of the deaths we've had in our state are from people who are 65 years and older. The single biggest correlation to mortality and getting the virus is age. So we focused on those groups that are 65 years and older. And as we've said, next week, and some of our health departments, as, as Angeline already said, have gone to 50 to 64, so we're going to be stepping to the next age bracket because that's the next most vulnerable. And when it comes to, uh, again, making sure that we're getting the vaccine out, again, I just reference, um, you know, the New York Times has this as uh, 12th highest as far as overall doses being used at 82 uh, percent. The CDC has a number eight for the number of uh, people who are 18 years and older as a, you know, doses administered to those folks per 100,000. So uh, I gave a lot of those stats earlier that show that uh, Nebraska ranks very well overall in the country. And of course, one of the ones we just talked about was because we focused on older folks, we're number five as far as the number of people who are vulnerable that we've been reaching with vaccines. So uh, I think we're doing the right plan for Nebraska. All right, uh, we have a question from Mark Vail, KLIN. Since the IRS has extended the filing deadline to May 17th, will Nebraska be extending also? And the answer is yes. Uh, we covered that one already. And the provision allowing 10200 in unemployment compensation received in 2020 to be tax-free, will Nebraska max that provision for those uh, uh, compensation, uh, or will, those compensa will that compensation be taxed? So again, the way we do our taxes here, as I said, we marry ours to the federal tax code. And where we start our tax process for our state income taxes picks up with adjusted gross income. If that 10,200 is not being included in your federal adjusted gross income, we're starting without that in our calculation. So it will, the long and short, it will not be taxed because we will not pick that up as part of your adjusted gross income from your federal taxes as we start our Nebraska process for Nebraska state income taxes. And then uh, Mark Bomber, KSNB, if the legislature passes LB 371, the bill to allow casino gambling during the state fair and during county fairs, will the governor sign the bill? Again, I don't comment on bills that's early in the process with regard to uh, whether I'm going to sign them or veto them. Um, this bill still has a couple more rounds of debate to go through. All right, Taylor, do you have questions that were texted in while we were doing the press conference? So uh, Julie Anderson of the Omaha World Herald wants to know, will Douglas County be getting a drive through site at the metro area campus? And the answer is yes. And Angie, do we know, do we have a time frame when that's supposed to happen? We're shooting for April 1st. And we're shooting for April 1st on that to happen. So again, we will be doing that. It'll be starting April 1st is our goal. So the question was, we hear some people are going to smaller uh, town pharmacies to be able to get vaccines. And again, as I described earlier with the federal pharmacy program, that was, well, not earlier today, but previously I've said the federal pharmacy program was really launched uh, very quickly by the federal government without a lot of coordination with the state. And so they have their own signups. We haven't brought them in together with the entire state system. So uh, it is possible to travel from one you know, county to another county to get that vaccine. Uh, however, you still have to be a Nebraskan to be able to do that. So part of their sign up is to make sure that you got, uh, that you're a Nebraskan before you're coming and getting that vaccine. So uh, that is, it is possible for that to occur. So any estimate for when people will be vaccinating people under the age of 50? And Julie, just like with all the others, it just depends on how many people sign up and how quick the uptake is for the, that category age 50 to 64 plus. So we can't give you an estimate right now on that. And then Matt Holbert in this journal, so I want to know if we can get an update on the DRAS system. We heard that two rivers in Central Health told us earlier this week they are uh, already doing that. So uh, I'm sorry, Matt who with the journal, sir? Wilberding? Oberding. Matt Oberding with the journal Star wants to know, 
What's the update on the VRAS system? That's the system that the state is putting together to really pull together all the signups and inventory management and everything, scheduling into one statewide system that will ultimately have everybody on it. And uh, he heard that there was a couple of health districts who were using it. Angie, you want to just kind of come up and give us a quick update on that? Sure. So for the, the VRAS system is what we call it. And um, Central had a fully functional um, clinic yesterday with, I think it was around 2,000 people, and that went really well. And Two Rivers is also using it 100%. We have a couple that are on board. They're using half the system and then, and then rolling into the rest of it in the next... In the next week, we'll have the majority of our health departments fully functional on the VRAS system. And that's really based on where their schedules were already scheduled out to and kind of when that transition happens. So um, more information to come on that, but the transition is happening and they're doing really well. Great, thank you very much, Angie. All right, questions for people here in the room, Fred. So uh, the question Fred's asking is, what kind of practical difference will that make? And the answer is really, it's a part of what we're doing as far as communication to get the word out that, hey, you know, please sign up for the, the vaccination. And to certainly give uh, some of the counties that weren't at the 50 to 64 the, you know, the, the guidelines that they can now start. If they've got clinics and they've, they've really kind of used up or they, they can't get any more 65 years and older to sign up for those clinics, they can start bringing those folks 50 and above into those clinics. So really to just share the guidelines and the guidance that they can start bringing in younger people into those clinics if they can't fill them up with 65 year olds. They couldn't make that determination on their own. So no, uh, well again, we had previously written the DHM so that you, uh, we worked with the, the directors. They cannot actually, they're not, they're not supposed to, like, just like going to the telecom companies, they're not supposed to be going outside of our guidance. So we actually have that all written down for a reason so that everybody's staying on the same page. But if the guidance up until now has been 65 and above, how is it that some are? Because we, we adjusted our DHMs to allow some of the uh, uh, health departments who were already having trouble filling up their, um, their schedules with 65 years and older, they kind of moved through that category already. So there were some that were helping, uh, you know, were struggling with their clinics to be able to get more people. We already allowed them to move forward. I don't know, Angie, is there anything else you want to say on that one? The, if you're referencing the like 90,000 that's already been vaccinated, those are from work groups. So for the younger population, a lot of it's from the work groups. And, and then there are some people who are in that younger category from the work groups that were vaccinated as well, about 90,000. Andrew. I'm sorry, so what have I been able to find out with regard to telecom workers? Well, we're following up with Douglas County with regard to why they decided to go outside the guidelines to do telecom workers. I think it was a misunderstanding on their part. Uh, I think they believe they were part of utility workers, even though our guidelines very specifically were that telecom was not part of utility. So we're following up Douglas County to make sure we've got a good line of communication with regard to who is eligible going forward. So the question is, uh, how did we find out about that? And Angie, uh, how did we find out about that? We found out in the news. Okay. And, and um, are you seeing any counties getting pressured or lobbied, you know, um, by different businesses to get those people vaccinated? Because that's what we're trying to do. So Andrew's asking, are we seeing uh, health departments getting lobbied by businesses to get their people vaccinated? And while we occasionally get uh, people contacting our office, with regard to that, I'm guessing that probably the health directors also get contacted occasionally, but we have weekly health, uh, we have weekly calls that I'm on with the local health departments as well as multiple weekly calls that the team is on, and I have not heard that feedback that the health directors feel like they're being unduly pressured by local businesses to get vaccinated. Yeah. Any Uh, do we have any idea how many vaccines were given out to the telecom companies? And uh, we don't, at this point, have any indication what that is. We're following up Douglas County. Yeah, Andrew. Do you have any idea how many people are, are in that uh, 64 to 50 age group? 
Uh, so Andrew's asking, how many people do we have in that 50 to 64 category? I think you said like 350,000? About 350,000. 350, yeah, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, so Andrew's asking, uh, there had been some concern, and in fact, even a lawsuit launched uh, from some attorneys general with regard to uh, would states be allowed to do tax cuts if they took the federal uh, stimulus money? And the Treasury Department came out with guidance saying, no, you're not going to have to worry about that as long as you're not using the federal dollars to replace dollars you would have lost because of a tax cut. And certainly here in Nebraska, if you look at where our revenues are, the tax cuts that we're proposing that I proposed are not being enabled at all in any way, shape, or form by the federal uh, stimulus package. So, uh, and I think I said this in a, a, about a week ago that we didn't really have any concerns here in Nebraska because our revenues are so strong that the tax cuts we're going to be able to do are well justified given our state revenues and they have nothing to do with the stimulus package. Fred. Sure. So, Dr. Antonio, would come up. Uh, Fred's got a question about uh, latest uh, questions or latest figures on meat processing facilities. So, as far as the uh, meat processing plants are concerned, we have a total of seven thousand two hundred and thirty-six cases identified. 27 deaths, and 255 total hospitalizations. This was as of last week. And you have an vaccination plan? I don't have that number. Um, I don't know if Angie has a number or not on vaccinations and meat processing plants, but I know they're strongly ongoing right now. They are. They've all either been started or scheduled. So they're either started or scheduled. Uh, so Fred asked about what the universe of people is of the 7,000 of the cases that have... Yeah, I mean, that's out of 15,000, 30,000. So how many meat processing plant workers do we have? I don't know that number, Angie. I, I really can't tell you, Fred, right now. We can get back to you on that, though. You know, the, Andrew asked a question, are we concerned that people aren't getting tested anymore? So, you know, obviously we keep track of those numbers, and my numbers for this week, for the number of average tests we're doing per day, is right around 8,340 of an average per day, which is actually more than last week and more than the week before. So I think we, there was con some concern that people weren't getting tested, but according to our numbers, the test, the number of people getting tested has been very stable over the last several weeks. So it's dropped from we, we did have a drop, you know, maybe about a month ago or so, especially during when we had the bad cold weather and snowstorms and things like that. You know, that was obvious we were going to have a drop then. But since then, it's picked back up to around that 8,000 per day number. Yes, it is. The question is from Julie Anderson about the number of cases from the beginning of the pandemic, and yes, that's true. We have another question from Julie from the governor. Thank you, Dr. Antone. So Julie Anderson of the World Herald wants to know with regard to are we going to prioritize college students to be able to get vaccinated before the fall? Uh, and again, we're going to be focusing on people who are the most vulnerable to having those very severe outcomes, including mortality. So we do not have any plans to vaccinate college students ahead of everybody, uh, ahead of anybody else. Now, having said that, what we expect is that as we go through our age groups and get those most vulnerable people, that we will be able to open this up to anybody who wants to get vaccinated uh, in the not too distant future, so certainly sometime this spring. So that's well before 
the fall. So I expect that it'll, the vaccine will be readily available to just about anybody long before we hit uh, you know, the fall semester. Fred. Andrew, what was the record number of vaccines that we delivered yesterday? It was 22,252. The answer is 22,253 vaccines were delivered yesterday. Record amount. And de delivered in arms. Yeah. Yeah, so, Andrew. Uh, Andrew's asking, why do I think we have jumped up in the vaccination charts nationally? And it is because we've gotten a great cooperation from our local health departments. They've done a fantastic job. I and mean, you can just go look at Lincoln Lancaster and the work that Pat Lopez has done here, or the vaccination clinics we've done in Douglas County. But it, you know, those are just a couple of examples. All of our health directors are very keenly focused on delivering those vaccines. And from the state standpoint, Angie Ling and her team has worked very closely with the health departments to really keep a focus on getting this done, to driving, and it's been a laser-like focus by our team at the Department of Health and Human Services to make sure that we're getting vaccines out as quickly as possible. So we've been doing things like following up, you know, daily looking at inventory reports from the pharmacies to make sure they're not sitting on any, looking at all of our health departments to see if there's any uh, doses of vaccines that seem to be building up. So daily, we're monitoring the inventories to be able to find out if anything seems to be getting slowed down. How do we address that, get that obstacle out of the way, and make sure those vaccines are getting to people's arms? And I guess conversely, so the question is, why do we uh, have the dip in our ranking then early on? And I think just like anything else, right, as we put a system in place, We've got to learn how to get better at that system. And I think, for example, the inventory management is one of those things that we uh, were able to improve upon to get a better idea of where vaccines were. And frankly, I think, uh, you know, again, the federal pharmacy program, the retail pharmacy program, was certainly one of the areas uh, that we ex experienced challenges with early on because that program was really launched without coordination from the state by the federal government that we had to really establish those ties and get those working relationships going. Yeah, go ahead. And so the question is, how many doses have gone to waste in Nebraska? And Angie, do we have a number for that? I don't have an exact number on hand. We don't have an exact number on hand, but we can follow up and get that for you. Is it a lot? Uh, do you have an idea? It's a lot. I, my recollection is a pretty small number. Yeah. Um, there was a number from the White House on a national number, and it was like a fraction of a percent nationwide, like a very, very small number nationwide as well. So the question is, are there still pockets of people who uh, have been declined to get the vaccine? And I think it's really a, a personal case-by-case -case basis. So I don't know that we have any data about any you know, broad population. But I think it's important that, again, if you're interested in getting the vaccine, please sign up to get the vaccine because it's, again, not something you can just show up and get. You have to schedule that ahead of time. So please sign up at vaccinate.ne.gov or call the 833 number you know, 833-998-2275 to get signed up because we reach out to you to get those, get those appointments scheduled. You can't just show up and get them. Time for, one or two more questions. Time for just a couple more questions. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. And Taylor, I presume you don't have any more? All right, great. Well, I just want to thank our guest today. Dr. Walsh, thank you very much for uh, coming from the Nebraska Medical Association. And again, thank you to all the great work that doctors have been doing throughout the course of this last year to keep us all healthy and to help us recover from the uh, coronavirus and get us through this pandemic. We very much appreciate it. And Angie, as always, thank you very much for being here to help us get updated on where we are with regard to the vaccine program. Again, folks, uh, we're going to have our press briefing here 10 a.m. on Monday. Next week will be National Ag Week, so I want to highlight that. Tomorrow is meat on the menu day, so don't forget about that. Make sure you go out and get your nice portion of uh, you know, lean meat to go with a healthy diet. 
and support our farmers and ranchers. And of course, it's going to be a nice weekend, so please enjoy the great weekend and look forward to talking to everybody again next week. But don't forget, if you're still in a pandemic, wash your hands, wear your mask, watch your distance, avoid the three C's. They're all, those are all the things we can do to help slow the spread of the virus so we can get people vaccinated. Have a great weekend.